then Veronica and um, Raquel. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Silke. And, and just to say thanks so much to you know you and colleagues in, in Madagascar and Vietnam and Mexico. It was so inspiring um, to hear about the work, um, to hear sort of the way that you're grappling with, with the challenge, because uh, I think it is a significant challenge um, of bringing gender inequality work to the heart of, of, of social protection. Um, I think one of the things that's a real takeaway for me, both in the in the panel that we had at the beginning of the event and also in the in the presentations on on the joint programs is just how strong some of the key messages are that are coming through in, in every presentation. Um, if I could sort of boil them down to two main ones from my perspective, um, I think the first is the absolutely critical need to respond to gendered needs across the life cycle. So, you know, just honing in on one aspect of a social protection system just isn't isn't um, isn't adequate. Um, whether that's pensions or child benefits or whatever we really um, drill down into, we need we need to have that comprehensive coverage. And universal doesn't mean just one thing for everyone. It means that we have um, have that support across the life cycle. So I think that's really critical. Um, and also that we that we're pragmatic and we look at different models to ensure that that coverage is scaled up. So particularly for workers in the informal economy and then for um, people living in families that rely on uh, the wages of people working in the inform informal economy. So I think that's critical. And then the second thing that's come out so strongly is the absolutely critical um, case for investing in care systems. Um, and I, I think of that as sort of across the spectrum of care needs and that being gender responsive, disability inclusive, um, and, and very much you know, supporting the whole leave no one behind agenda. Um, I do think that care is like the forgotten cousin or the forgotten child of social protection. It's not even seen as part of social protection sometimes, but it's an absolutely fundamental part of it. So, so that's, that's a big takeaway for me. And then in terms of sort of some of the, the best practice, the lessons that are coming out, um, uh, just highlight a, a few things quickly. Um, the first I thought was really interesting was around uh, the work that's been done, done in Madagascar around linking to GBV response and prevention services. You know, it's seen as something which is like an, an add-on, a kind of optional, um, something that's not really core to, um, to support for women and girls and families, um, but it is absolutely possible. Um, we've seen from the pandemic, it's sh shone a spotlight, um, not only on the care and poverty crisis, but on, on you know, the unforgivable um, high rates of GBV um, that women and girls in particular are facing. Um, and so I think, you know, there's a, this is a call to action. Um, we know that it can be done. We know we can link the social protection systems with um, GBV response services. Um, and I think that should be the default. Um, I think the second thing that's really come out is just how important it is to work together. And I mean that in every sense, within the UN family, with other stakeholders, you know, with local authorities, with sort of um, local and national governments, depends on the structure, but really pulling together with civil society organizations, women's rights, girls' rights, feminist organizations, um, and so on, towards this, this you know, overall ambition of universal coverage and, and all, all of what that means. Um, I do think that it's a big challenge and, and I've seen in the comments some people highlighting not uh, every agency, not every organization has that as the goal. Um, and, and I think what we can do with events like this is to really highlight the, the case for it, how critical it is for, for responding to the crisis of poverty and care. Um, and then the third thing that I thought was interesting and, and bringing in a little bit of our, our learning from, from other work across the joint programs as well is it can be incredibly useful to do these sort of gender assessments of the social protection program to invest in sort of assessment of the, the policy, but there has to be that follow through. We have to have buy-in from the beginning um, and we have to follow through on the recommendations that are identified. I think too often we get an assessment of a social protection program or a system and then, and then that's it. We see that there are gaps and, and the follow through is what's actually going to make any real difference to people's lives. So just wanted to highlight that as I think a learning which um, you know, colleagues have sort of shown that paving the way in these particular countries, but something that we can learn on, learn from for, for the portfolio overall. Over. Hi, thanks, um, Silke and Ruth. Um, I um, also wanted to thank all the joint program presentations. Uh, very, very enlightening. Um, you know, like we heard in the opening panel, which was excellent, COVID-19 exposed pre-existing inequalities across gender, across other dimensions. And, um, you know, what, what I took away from these joint programs um, was how good they were at addressing 
you know, already preempting and addressing these underlying inequalities. Uh, take the case of Vietnam. So um, the socioeconomic uh, impact assessment in Vietnam showed that the national poverty rate uh, went up from 4.6% to 26.7% in April 2020, right at the peak of the COVID crisis. But then the transient income poverty reduced to 15.8% in May 2020. However, the improvements were not the same across the board. The least improvements were for informal workers, for ethnic minorities, and female-headed households. Um, now, we can already see how some of the joint programs were, un were addressing these underlying inequalities. For example, the Vietnam program uh, that I'm represented, uh, they already worked on a comprehensive care package, uh, making sure that women in their childbearing, uh, key childbearing years uh, stay in the labor force. We heard all the details about that. We heard about the pension system, how that was um, strengthened with a focus on women to take account of the variable ability to contribute in pensions and social insurance. And then we also heard about the digital tools that were introduced, uh, which are becoming very important uh, right after the COVID crisis. They were key in rapid rollout of uh, you know, cash transfers, and uh, it was very important to take uh, gender differences into account. Uh, like Andre was saying, um, digital tools actually can make it easier for parents with care responsibilities to access uh, cash and other resources. At the same time, we also have to take into account that there can be differences in access to digital tools. And uh, it can be important to have uh, complementary mechanisms, uh, for example, feet on the ground agents who can reach uh, households, female-headed households, and women who are harder to reach. Um, and I'll stop here. Thanks, Shivani. Yeah. We have Veronica next. Sorry, Veronica. Yes, thanks. <laughs> I was just uh, about to open my mic. Um, first of all, also from my side, thanks a lot to the excellent uh, presentations. I mean, having been involved in the operational committee of the SDG Joint Fund, it's really exciting to now hear from the proposals that we selected, how they put all their ideas into practice and things happening, uh, going from paper into reality. and. Um, and really excellent work uh, having been carried out. And I, I guess the, the key takeaway for me is a very positive message that the joint programs are demonstrating that progress on closing social protection gender gaps uh, can be made where political will exists and um, to really with care is taken to develop solutions that are tailored to the specific context and realities of women across the life cycle. And um, this goes hand in hand with my second takeaway that it context matters so much and there, there are no one size fits all solutions. There is such a diversity of needs, cultural context that really it's a, it's a matter of um, developing case by case idiosyncratic solutions and combinations, as Shara said, across social insurance, social assistance and services, uh, most important of which care services, but there are also other services that are important. Um, and we've seen very beautifully how this can work out in the case, uh, cases of Madagascar, Vietnam um, and Mexico. Um, the other thing I think that came out very clearly was the importance of creating strong policy and legal frameworks. Uh, entitlements need to be the right space to be sustainable. Um, and so, I mean, we've heard about Mexico, the national care system law and the social protection strategy. Um, also in Vietnam, all the important legal reforms. Uh, this is really the basis for, for creating um, sustainable social protection systems. Um, also important uh, strengthening capacities, uh, and, and this is banal, of course, I mean, we always say, well, the, yeah, we need to build up local capacities, but I mean, I think it, it came out clear that it's important to really pay attention to capacities at all level of the administration. And also sometimes we have gender experts here and social protection experts there. And um, I guess the important thing here is to, to, to really um, ensure gender expect expertise in the social protection community um, to, to be able to, to develop, design and implement gender responsive social protection systems. Um, and I think, I mean, the fact that so many joint programs had a very strong angle on gender shows that we're already uh, on that way, but I think more 
uh, can be done on this. Um, then um, uh, finally, and this builds very much on, on what Ruth said about um, uh, uh, working together in partnership and getting everybody on board, the importance of coordination. Um, uh, I think this came out very strongly from the Vietnamese uh, case again. Um, and again, it's, I mean, this is at all levels. I mean, it's at a very technical level, just to ensure interoperability between schemes and programs at a, at a higher level to, to ensure uh, policy coherence across sectors, uh, policy coherence between care policies and social protection policies. Um, but also we've heard so much about um, economic inequalities, unequal access to the labor market, uh, discrimination in, in employment policies. So, I mean, the social protection system cannot make up all the inequal inequalities generated um, by it. By, by the labor market in a way. So, I mean, if, if we want to look at gen we, gender inequalities in social protection, we also need to go to gender inequalities in uh, on the labor market. And I think, um, I mean, we've talked so much about uh, the, the informal economy. This has come come out very strongly. We need to create equal access to, to decent employment um, and, and social insurance uh, for women to, um, to, to close a lot of the uh, gaps, both in terms of access to social protection, but also in terms of the, the benefit that is provided. And, and this also goes to, to wage differences, et cetera. So, I mean, the, uh, this, this has come out uh, clearly as well. Um, and I'll, I'll hand, here and, uh, hand here and hand over to Raquel. Okay, thank you. Thank you, well, colleagues. Also, I want to add my, my words to, to have this opportunity. Yeah, to add our voices and our perspectives and also to learn from, from the experiences from, from the country level. What, what, really, what I was really delighted to see concrete experiences on, on how this gender agenda, I mean, gender can be go beyond these uh, social protection policies that were gender sensitive and then gender responsive. And now I think we are at a maturity level of seeing a real gender transformation examples uh, on these on some of these programs. And, and for example, I think uh, one of the key takeaways of one of the, th of the key learnings that we saw is, is how we do really achieve a change in the position of women women that can lead their own decisions and have agency to, 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 to lead their own lives. And, and looking at the, the examples of the, of the programs, we, we can see increasing in access of income services. Uh, but I want to highlight one thing that is really, really important for us, uh, which is access to time of their own. Uh, women dedicate time for many tasks, uh, productive, reproductive, and also women are mainly uh, focused on dedicating time for others. While we, in the examples we saw, we, we could see, uh, and, and through, for example, the example of, of Mexico of promoting uh, care integrated systems, we can have women redu reducing the time dedicated to unpaid care work and then have time to, for their own, time for their own to transform their, their lives, to, to add it to one of the main assets they have. So we need to, women have to have assets, I mean, access to, to income, to skills, digital skills, as, as, as in, in Vietnam, the case, but we, they also need to have access to time and time for their own to participate in decision-making, to train themselves, to, to have networking, et cetera, and also to take care of themselves. So I think that's one of the main, uh, I think, gains in seeing transformation in, in social protection programs. And the other ones I think it was also highlighted is the importance of achieving changes in social norms. So, so for example, if we achieve uh, the way we, uh, we, we see care and, and the way we need to see care as a social responsibility, not just women's responsibility. This will allow to, to redistribute uh, the care burden between women and men, but also between 
the state and, and the private sector and the community and, and all the actors engage and then um, really promoting this co-responsibility. And the final thing I like to highlight is, is the, the importance in this transformation is, is the recognition. And by recognition, I, I don't mean, you know, like clapping women when they do something. Recognition means accessing to, to real uh, rights. And in the case of, of social protection, um, the programs are recognizing and, and facilitation recognition of the, of the contributions that women already do, rural women, domestic workers, etc. And these recognitions can be brought uh, by, by, you know, by having access to social uh, security system schemes, access, um, adapting them and ensuring that they, they, they join. But also if we look at the own word of contributory, contributory, contributory schemes, uh, they, are, they are reflecting a contribution in, in, in money, in cash. Uh, the schemes are contributory when women or men pay, but uh, maybe we can start thinking uh, beyond, beyond, the, beyond the framework, the additional framework and changing the name because women do contribute, maybe not in cash, to development and to social protection in many ways. And for example, in Madagascar, women were disseminating the messages and going to communities and ensuring that women in the communities were uh, alerted by the, by the, by the programs uh, uh, facilities. So, so recognizing the role that women play and the role and the contributions of women and also looking at the contributory and not contributory schemes in a different perspective. Thank you. Thanks Raquel, thanks everyone. Um, we don't have a whole lot of questions in the Q&A, but there were questions previously. Some of you have answered them. Um, some of you may wish to come back to some of these questions. Um, I also wanted to, and I, I have other questions for you, but I also wanted to pick up on one, one theme that struck me from the um, joint program presentations, which was about the importance of the subnational level, actually. And so as we kind of, as, as we address the questions that, um, that come up now in this segment, perhaps if any one of you wants to reflect on that, um, Veronica um, already mentioned kind of the importance of capacity building at all levels, but I think it's at the provincial and very often at the municipal level, right, where people kind of, um, that's the interface, where people gain access to services, access to benefits, where a lot of the coordination needs to happen to kind of um, make sure that that needs are attended to in an integrated way. So if, um, if any one of you wanted to kind of speak a little bit to that theme, you're welcome. Um, otherwise, I, I thought we would um, talk a little bit more as well about kind of lessons that we've learned as the UN system from this first um, portfolio of social protection programs. Um, based on the previous three presentations, but also everything else that you know about other um, joint programs um, that have been conducted. Um, so um, perhaps um, starting with um, Shivani, um, what are the key lessons for you from this first portfolio of the UNSDG Fund Finance Joint Programs? Um, beyond kind of some of the things that we've already heard about and especially on the theme of kind of um, the UN working together as one. Thanks, Elke. Um, you know, um, going forward and looking at uh, strategic priorities, um, one of the main things, um, you know, in my portfolio at UNDP is looking at the informal economy and uh, MSMEs and uh, how they can be integrated into social protection, um, better integrated into contributory schemes, but also targeted through uh, non-contributory schemes and programs. And, uh, you know, as, uh, as we work in countries, uh, we see the importance of working jointly with other agencies. For example, uh, for, example for MSMEs, uh, we look at different tools, different business development solutions, and uh, many of these are, um, you know, we work closely with ILO in a number of countries uh, and other agencies because uh, we, can't, we can't do it on our own, like has been emphasized by colleagues, uh, you know. Um, we also, 
in 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 the realm of business development solutions we see a lot of emphasis and a lot of interest on e-commerce uh, related tools and you know i already mentioned the importance of uh, digital tools and making sure that the men are also getting equal access to these tools and uh, you know this is also uh, related to another important point and uh, important takeaway for me that a lot of colleagues have mentioned on social norms and cha- uh, changing social no- um, gender sex social norms so as we uh, you know strengthen social protection programs uh, we have to make sure that we are we are also nudging away from uh, patriarchal social norms so for women it's not all about uh, you know learning basic techniques uh, like basket weaving or uh, simple industries like that or about uh, making sure they have time to take care of their children uh, it should also be about enhancing the men's agency uh, making sure that they have digital tools uh, they have the right education technical skills for example how about women being so, uh, solar technicians or solar engineers and you know agents for change as we transition to a green economy you know as we deal with uh, the changing landscape um it's also important to look at uh, multi dimensional and intersectional perspectives um you know the joint programs were very strong on including people with disabilities and that has to be continued um uh, it's important to look at conflict situations uh, displaced people uh, how women are uh, disproportionately disproportionately impacted in these situations and how they should be integrated um and uh, you know one final thing i would say is that we have to use this moment um, the covid-19 crisis has been a big setback on many fronts but it's being recognized that there's also been a lot of innovation uh, there is a, a lot of momentum uh, we have to make sure financing is uh, you know ring fenced it's uh, made sustainable so that many of these innovative ideas that came up after the crisis they can be taken up they can be institutionalized and uh, you know everybody has to come together at the technical level at the uh, financing tax um, base strengthening level and um yeah and that's the way forward thanks very much shivani um i would like to continue with veronica um and and ask you in particular for your assessment about how the un joint sdg fund has improved collaboration um between un agencies um and i also thought it it would be worth um for you or others to reflect on the role that the gender marker that was integrated and in, into the selection of the programs um as as mentioned by lisa at the beginning kind of the role that has played and whether you think it's contributed to strengthening the the gender um emphasis of of these joint programs Uh, thanks, Silke. Um, I mean, overall, I think across the 35 uh, joint programs that were funded through the SDG Joint Fund, but also, I mean, um, Lisa mentioned this in, in her introductory um, statement, the 114 countries, uh, or rather proposals that were developed by, by joint uh, country teams, um, I think this process of jointly developing a proposal um, already strengthened collaboration in and of itself um, because it fosters mutual understanding. Each agency comes with their own man- mandate, uh, sometimes with their own definition, but certainly with their own perspective and approach to social protection and their own priorities. And it's, it's important as a first step to ex- exchange across agencies to gain an understanding of where the other agencies are coming from. And then based on this improved understanding, built a joint vision for in this concrete country context as a UN country team, how can we best work um, jointly on social protection? And, and this requires this, this understanding of, um, as I said before, different agencies' strengths and, and, and how expertise and um, how they complement each other. And, uh, and this, I think this whole process w- was, was required Uh, to go through the joint fund application. And um, I've heard from from, uh, country teams where even if they didn't get the SDG joint fund 
um, financing, they, they, they were really into it and really enthusiastic and said, we, they're definitely going to take this work forward now and they're going to, to um, mobilize other resources. And um, so it certainly, it, it triggered, um, uh, it, in some cases, a, a very positive dynamic of, of uh, strengthening joint work at country level on, on social protection. And then, of course, um, those that did receive the financing, I mean, I think the, the joint fund structure in and of itself of um, having this joint reporting cycle and, and uh, uh, joint implementation also to some extent um, really fosters exchange and I think out of exchange grows collaboration. Um, but I, I think another element that, that um, I observed was really, really useful were, were these peer-to-peer -peer exchanges that the uh, UN Joint Fund Secretariat organized where um, there were different uh, clusters um, of, of uh, JPs working on similar themes that could just exchange among each other how they go about things. And, and again, I think this was this was very useful for, for strengthening collaboration across agencies. Um, so yeah, I think through these various avenues, uh, um, definitely uh, collaboration has been strengthened. And I think this is also something that will stay once you have this improved understanding of, of, of where different agencies are coming from, uh, even for future, for identifying future joint work opportunities, it will be much easier and you have a completely different starting point if you now sit um, together and, and, and start uh, designing uh, future activities in the area of gender and social protection. Great, thank you, Veronica. Very important points. I um, I want to move on to um, Raquel, and actually, I thought it um, would be interesting to take um, one of the questions um, from the chat, if you don't mind. I mean, if you want to add to what uh, Veronica has has uh, said as well, I think that would be an, a, a, a interesting. You support several um, country offices in, in the lab region where UN Women is part of several joint programs. So anything you may have to add on that, I think would be interesting. But there's also a message in the Q&A now that is about, you know, particularly in, in light of kind of the tight fiscal context that many countries are, in right now, social protection and investments in care services, as we've also heard in the first session, are often seen as an expenditure. Um, and that's one, that's a key barrier, right? How can you and agencies work better together to make the case that this is the moment to invest um, and let a more inclusive, gender sensitive social protection um, um, investments, how can these investments support economic recovery? Um, over to you. Sorry, that were several questions in one, so you pick and choose. <laughs> no, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And also allowing the participation on, on, on the chat. Yeah, well, in terms of the challenges, I, 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 I do think, uh, and, and I'm gonna try to link my, my, my point on the challenge with, the quest, with the, answering the question. I think precisely one of the main challenges, uh, I mean, we, we have already agreed that care should be a fundamental pillar of, of social protection, right? But we, we have to address this challenge of, of seeing care more as an expenditure rather than an investment. And, and, and in order to do so, and I think Mexico is one of, of an excellent examples, is we do have tools, by the way, tools that that were originated uh, within the, the UN agencies teams on, on not just costing uh, what, what implementing care services imply, but also calculating the benefits and the returns on, on generated by, by implementing care systems. This, these returns might come through different ways. The, the first one is the employment, the direct employment that is created which is, if, if correctly addressed, is, is a decent work employment, which generates good working conditions, thus re generates returns in terms of, of, of taxes and in social protection and uh, social security contributions. Uh, there's also a return in, in terms of, of well-being and, and human capacities, and, and it's already proven, and, and UNICEF and, and many of the agencies here 
have also made uh, studies on this, when kids have uh, uh, um, care systems as uh, um, uh, child care systems implemented of quality implemented since the very beginning, they also perform better in the educational systems. But we can apply that to, to care policies and services in general. When people are covered in their care needs, uh, they, they do not, sometimes they do, they, they, they do not need uh, uh, so intensively the, the, the health system in, in a way because they, they can take care of their own needs at the beginning, right? And, and also we have returns in, term, in terms, I was, as I was saying, of time, of liberating time of women that then can invest it in, in other uh, activities such as, uh, for example, in the labor market, they bring more income to their houses and their homes. So they do um, a sort of being able to uh, mobilize economies and household economies uh, contributing to the to the consumption and to activating the economy. So uh, investing in care systems has clear uh, gains. It's not just an, uh, an expenditure. And I think the tools that, for example, have been developed in the framework of, of the Mexico uh, project, which also uh, uh, um, um, improve other tools that were already there creating in, in previous programs are really critical to, to enhance this agenda. Thanks very much, uh, Raquel. Um, I'll hand over to Ruth and I want to, sorry, not make your life um, terribly difficult, but the activity in the chat has picked up a little bit. So I'll just um, throw out some of the things that have come up there and then, you know, feel free to address uh, some of those. And then we'll have a final round as well of reflections where perhaps we can pick uh, some of these things up if, if they can't be addressed now. Um, um, more generally, um, I wanted to come back to the issue of sectoral linkages that has been raised kind of um, throughout um, the webinar and ask you about the kinds of sectoral link linkages that you think deserve specific attention um, in, in terms of the, for social protection to address gendered needs, gendered risks and vulnerabilities and so on. Um, there was a question previously in the chat um, about paternity leave um, as a tool for changing social norms. Um, and, and I thought, given UNICEF's work on, on family friendly policies, you may want to come back on that. And then just now we've had a question um, more specifically on the gender marker. Um, um, someone asking whether it is enough with a requirement to have a gender marker to secure funding for gender equality in the context of these programs, or do we need to have a financial um, target in terms of all programs should be spending so and so much? So um, any of you who would like to come back on some of these things, um, feel free and Andrew, you, you have the stage. Great, thank you so much. Um, there's definitely a lot there. Um, maybe if I start with the linkages to, to different sort of sexual areas, um, there's, there's, there's three things that I want to say really. The first is that it's really critical to pay attention to how, how we're designing and implementing um, these sort of the support that is linked to social um, protection, um, whether that's nutrition or health or parenting support um, or you know maternal maternal health specifically um, I do think if what we've what we've learned and what we've seen from the evidence is that if 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 those are going to support um, work tackling gender inequality um, we need to have a, a focus in both how they're designed and how they're implemented um, on on gender and, and and women's and girls empowerment and um, so I think if we think about this very practically for example in Burundi we're looking at um, the sort of plus the linkages to different components uh, to a cash transfer program in ECD in parenting and maternal health um, and in financial inclusion for women um, those could all be designed and delivered in a way that is fairly gender blind or gender sensitive or we could look at how do we actively respond to uh, women's and girls needs and how do we ensure that there's a, a 
approach that focuses on shifting um, harmful gender norms. Um, so uh, just to sort of illustrate, I think you know, that's the kind of spectrum of activity that we're looking at. Um, so whatever the linkages are to whatever the, the, the services or the, or the behavior change components, what's critical is that we are designing and implementing them in a way that, that has gender inequality um, and empowerment at its heart. Um, I do think there's quite interesting um, evidence around the importance of um, building women's social networks and girls um, networks and, and capital and um, so we've seen lots of interesting um, evidence around for example uh, linkages between cash and nutrition that actually have an impact on intimate partner violence because they supported social capital and, and, and networks um, parenting modules that uh, if they have a focus on relationship um, building and non-violent communication can have an impact on a whole range of factors so um, yeah I think I think that's sort of an area for increased attention, um, particularly sort of linking back to your point around capacity, who is actually delivering these programs and are we ensuring that they're supported um, with, with the, the skills, the time, um, even basic things like resources to travel to enable um, that those components to be delivered or those services to be delivered effectively. Um, there's much more I could say on that, but I think, I think I'll stop there. Um, the only other thing to say is I don't think it's an either or. So we can't say, right, the best investment is we're going to you know, link social assistance with parenting component and then, you know, the job is done. Clearly, we're talking about building a comprehensive um, uh, system and, and, and holistic uh, package of support. On, on the question around... Um, parental leave I, yes, I saw that I thought it was really interesting the question was around you know, sh should it be fully paid should it be equal in duration for um for, for men and women maternity and, and paternity if you like um and should it be non-transferable um and there's a few things that I wanted to highlight I mean echoing Raquel's point on very strong evidence base on investing in in, in these benefits um at every level in terms of women's well-being physical and mental in terms of children's well-being infant mortality healthy development um it's just a no-brainer and we need it for supporting women in their economic social empowerment their well-being and the next generation of children um both from a human rights perspective and in terms of you know economic growth um, fundamentally so that's critical um globally i think 55 percent of women don't have access to any form of maternity benefit for example so we are very very far from where we need to be in this um when it comes to sort of the the question specifically around parental leave i do think it's critical that um we we look with the way that policies are designed and implemented um to challenge this idea that care work is women's work um so absolutely there should be guarantees and and and, and policies that protect paid leave for parents um, and I do think there are you know, interesting models um, from around the world that look at sort of incentivizing um, and supporting um, men to, to take that leave. So we sort of the daddy quotas, as they're sometimes described, or um, protecting sort of three months you, for the secondary caregiver. You know, you, if you don't take it, you lose it. Um, I do want to highlight, though, I do think there are specific um, gendered uh, needs um, and uh, manifestations of discrimination, uh, which mean that we do need to protect some time for women and gestational parents. Um, and that's for sort of a full range of reasons. I'm thinking not just about the, the, the benefits, but sort of labor market protections. Um, so, so I think we need both is, is, the, is the short answer. Uh, we need maternity, paid maternity leave and protections, and we need um, uh, protected paid uh, parental leave. Um, but I just wanted to kind of draw out some of those, those nuances. And then um, the gender marker, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't seen the, the thing is it's written down but a, a brief reflection and if anyone any of the colleagues that were presenting the joint programs want to chip in on this I'd love to hear from them um, but my feeling is clearly it matters and it helps because there are lots of people who are here and ready to champion this gender but there are others that are coming from maybe less of a, a, a gender equality background who wouldn't necessarily immediately integrate it in at the same level so I think maybe it's an important way of um, ensuring that that um, it's integrated um but it isn't enough i think you know there's a we need resources to follow through on um integrating gender effectively into any any form of work um and it's also not just about have you ticked the box have you said we're definitely going to do it it's really about that commitment 
on the ground to making time for it, having capacity in, in the joint teams. I think what's amazing is, you know, hearing colleagues um, today, that's absolutely here and we can see that in practice, um, but that's not always automatically going to be the case. Um, so yeah, a, a little bit of a um, starting point answer, but I would love to hear from the colleagues that are working on this on the ground, any reflections they have on that, over. Thank you, Ruth, and um, thank you all. We're kind of again hitting the, the, the end of our session, but if, um, if um, colleagues from joint programs would like to come in on, on that particular point, do feel free to use the chat. We are looking at the chat. Um, um, and other than that, um, I think we're now kind of um, compelled to wrap up. And so I wanted to um, close with a question to all of you but also give you an opportunity to maybe take a minute or so, you know, if there anything, if, there, if there's anything that has come up now during the discussion that you would like to um, come back on. Um, and, you know, in addition to that, um, I think it'd be really nice to hear um, a bit of a forward looking perspective from you all about where you see the main opportunities and priorities for joint UN work on gender and social protection over the the next years and and um, an outline a little bit of a, of a perspective for us um, on that. So um, we'll start with Raquel and then go to Veronica, um, Shivani and Ruth. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Silke. Yeah, just a, a quick reaction on, on also Ruth's excellent point on, 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 on the gender market. I, I mean, I do agree gender marker has been an excellent tool and, and we have uh, evidence that when it's, it's even mandatory, at least to a dedicated percentage of the resources of these joint funds to projects that are marked in gender marker three, it has uh, actually provided a specific funding or prioritized. I do agree, which is not a given. And somebody already said it in the, on the floor, we do need gender experts also, I mean, uh, it's it's something that has to come uh, with with certain expertise, and I mean we always said we put the you know the lens of the gender lens, and we we know the, we do need to support other colleagues to to put this gender lens, but we do need gender experts to bring to the to the teams of of these projects. So and but but the, there's the Gifan and there's the Gifan on social protection. I think has excellent uh, examples on how to do this. So, so, so just adding on that. And, and finally, a, a last point or, or just a final title. I, I think we, we through this, through this event, we, we have seen how many things we can bring. I mean, gender is just, gender equality is not an option. You know, it's a mandate and, and, and it's essential for achieving a development. And the secretary general has said it over and over again. I think the the social protection uh, SDG fund to 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 look forward needs to continue ensuring that gender is a priority is uh, and that uh, I would say why I mean integrating care uh, to as as one of the priorities uh, because we did we do need and, and we have agreement we saw it in the first panel also in the presentation of the joint program and now in this dialogue that gender uh, has a common spheres to act as UN. We can bring added value from different perspectives. And, and it's certainly something that uh, the UN has a, a role to play in order to advance the agenda. So, so I would suggest uh, to continue with this, uh, with this window and this, and this fund, and hopefully to, to continue enhancing the gender uh, uh, integration and to integrating care as a priority. Over. <laughs> Thanks, over to Veronica. Yes, uh, so I think Shara mentioned the ILO work on the World Social Protection Database. Um, and I think this is clearly a comparative advantage for, for the UN system. And, and something that, that we can work on um, jointly, in, in particular, more specific research. I think research car carried out jointly by different UN agencies is, is richer. Um, it gets disseminated more widely. 
Um, and for country analytical work, uh, the, it also carries more acceptance and credibility than than single agency publications. So I think this is this is clearly um, uh, a, a priority to to do the analytical work jointly um, at at all levels, actually. Um, I think a very concrete opportunity that is that is coming up now or that that, that was launched uh, is as you I mean many of you may be aware that the Secretary General General on 28th of September launched this global accelerator on jobs and social protection which really brings together as I <laughs> emphasized before these these two sides of the same coin um, where I, I mean the ILO is definitely going to to play an active role in that and and we very much look forward uh, to to jointly with you ensure that that um, that uh, this accelerator will be um, activated with a strong gender responsive lens in it and um, uh, and yeah I mean of course I mean the objective is is more general on on job job rich sustainable and socially inclusive recovery um, and and uh, yeah we would uh, we we see this as a clear opportunity to work jointly with you on. On, on making sure it also um, has a strong gender component. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Veronica, for mentioning the Jobs and Social Protection Accelerator. Uh, as you know, UNDP has a global partnership with ILO, and we are also very much looking forward to working with you on operationalizing that in different countries, uh, particularly in the context of the accelerator. Um, in terms of joint work, yeah, like I mentioned already with ILO, but, um, you know, this discussion has also been really beneficial and, uh, you know, like, I just want to reiterate the importance of recognizing uh, care work. Uh, like we saw care, uh, the absence of care infrastructure holds women back from participating, uh, from having quality participation in the workforce. And, uh, you know, once again, the COVID-19 crisis has really underlined that we, I mean, care responsibilities have multiplied overnight uh, in, in large countries. For example, in India, children still do not go back to school. Um, they stay at home and that severely impacts uh, women's ability to join the labor force or, or maybe they're doing some work on the side, but they're not able to formally join the labor force. And this is the situation in many countries. We are still not out of that moment. And this shows you why social protection matters. It's true that uh, gender inequalities might be, must be addressed in the labor market, but social protection matters because uh, what we are seeing is that people who have suffered from the shock, the COVID-19 crisis, are not being able to return. And it's mostly women who are not being able to return. This is why social protection matters and gender-sensitive gender social protection matters. I'll stop here. Thank you. Do you want me to jump in? I know we basically run out. No, no, no worries. <laughs> I know we basically run out of time, so I'm gonna um, really just focus on one thing. This for me has been a really inspiring and energizing um, meeting. Um, I do think one of the big priorities as a next step is showcasing the strong voice that the UN system has on the urgent need to build gender responsive transformative social protection systems to national governments, um, you know, to really significant um, donors and, and international financial institutions that support the work. Um, I do think that in the sector at large, and we've seen that from the data, that actually systematically, this is still really not being addressed to any level. And it's easy in, in a room like this to think, wow, this is amazing, the momentum is building, we're getting there. Um, but we've seen only in the last 18 months that that pretty systematically we're we're reaching a very low bar of the uh, uh, sort of a, around a quarter of the, the measures being gender sensitive alone. Um, so I think, you know, a, a big push to showcase the kind of work that is that is you know on the ground we're scaling up it's working it's responding to needs the, that focus on a coordinated policy message um, across the UN system um, to to maybe stakeholders that are less bought in or just you know haven't haven't sort of um, seen the evidence uh, yet um, I think will be critical and then just to just to underline some of what Veronica said earlier I do think the SDG fund as a model I'm relatively new to the UN I'm two and a bit years in and I, I think in terms of design both at the sort of the country level and all the way through 
through to kind of the reviewing of the the portfolio the proposals and um, inputting it really is a great model for for helping UN agencies come together bringing that comparative advantage in and you can just see that in the design of the programs and what's being done how, how well reflected that is from you know GBB response services through to focus on the informal economy you know looking at um, needs across the life cycle um, so I think you know more of this echoing the message from Vietnam more of the same let's build from this momentum um, and, and take it to other partners over from me thanks so much Hey, thank you so much. That's a very, um, very nice note to end on. Um, and I just want to take the opportunity to thank everyone for their participation, the time you've made, the expertise, the experience, the knowledge you've brought to this exchange. I think it's been, it's been really incredible, really enriching. I've, I've learned a lot and I also wanted to take um, the opportunity to congratulate um, the team at the SDG Fund. Um, Ned, Maya, Liz, and, and colleagues for organizing this so well, for bringing people together um, and, and for putting a spotlight on gender equality in this very first kind of webinar on, on the SDG um, funded joint programs. So thanks to everyone. I hope you have a great rest of the day and it was a pleasure to spend these three hours with you. Thank you so much for phenomenal moderating as well, Silke. Bye, everyone. Yeah, Thank thanks, Silke. Thank Thank thanks you. to everyone who stayed until the very end. <laughs> thanks yes. for your interest. <laughs> bye, 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 everyone. Bye. Bye.